Today's episode of the Gestalt Education Show is brought to you by three of our favorite sponsors, Human Locomotion, Core 360 Bell, and Dynamic Disc Designs. All the information can be found below. By now, you have definitely heard us talk about them, so check out the show notes, click click the links, use the codes, and uh, make sure you support our favorite people. Uh, As always, we got a great episode lined up for you today, and thanks for tuning in. Right, everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Assault Education Show. Uh, we continue our tour of Parker Vegas here in Las Vegas. We're here at the uh, Caesars Forum. What a legend we got here! That's exactly right. Yeah. So today we sit down with Dan John. So Dan, you uh, you kind of revolutionized the world in talking about workouts in a way that isn't just single muscles, I think is my big thing. And, and uh, something that we were kind of just talking about it, Brett literally lives your life. So, I do. I uh, really do. you know, we, we kind of talk about the, the six found, uh, foundational movements and how to kind of build strength around it, which is basically what your, your life has been around. And uh, you're an author, uh, you're a presenter, you're a coach. Uh, but I don't know, let, 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 can we kind of start from the beginning? So the six fun foundational movements, like when, when did you kind of start building building programs around them? And when did it kind of click in your brain that that was where it needed to happen? You know, the history questions are always can be tough because when you're in the middle of doing this stuff, there's no, there's not always an obvious entry or exit. It's like you kind of just, you edge, you're like, no, that ain't working. No, that ain't working. No, that ain't working. And so you edge into it. it. I would say I was lucky. I'm probably... I'm a probably uh, one of the youngest people you'll know who kind of great came up in the great tradition. So I'm 67. So that's an important thing to remember. Yeah. So the great tradition was, you know, you had this 110 pound barbell, uh, 50 kilos, and you did these exercises. You did, um, you did a, a number of exercises. They're all, every one started on the floor. Right. Every single one of them, you know, overhead was something that's, you know, from the ground to overhead, from the ground in all these different variations. We didn't really have Frankenstein's monster training back then. And then, and I, I can draw the line to saying, I, I put it at 1975 with Arnold's education of a bodybuilder and the movie Pumping Iron. Which, oh God, what a movie. Which, yeah. Which I was at the premiere of. Uh, do you want to hear that story? Yeah, absolutely. Franco Colombo was the chiropractor actually. Yes, he, yes, he was. Yeah. A blessed memory, yes. Um, so we go, uh, so Tony Martin, Eric Suber and I are coming out of the, the, the film and we're obviously the only people who've ever lifted weights at the theater. And, uh, this limo pulls up and Arnold comes up and he gets out of the car and he looks like this. He goes like this and he sees me and he walks over. And he says, how did you like the movie? And I said, Jeepers Arnold, it was swell. Or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, you watch that movie, you read the book and you really kind of, you know, you, you fall for this thing because, you know, I got great respect for Arnold. I, I really honestly do. He clean and jerked uh, 308 pounds, 140 kilos. He snatched 242. Okay. I snatched 314 and cleaned 402. But when you look at Arnold, you look and you go, well, he's got to be a better discus thrower than little Danny over there. And there it is. Right there, 1975. I'm first starting out uh, as a Division One athlete. I'm, 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 I'm Olympic lifting, and all of a sudden, the gym is filled with people doing bodybuilding programs. Yeah. But, and Ar- Nautilus Arnold, machines. So Arnold's all. most complicated, you know, his, they didn't read chapters, you know, the first program, they ignored all those. They jumped right into his, you know, twice a day, six day a week thing. Right. And I can remember just kind of sitting around. It's like, no offense to my college uh, friends, but they were weak as kittens. Right. And so they're doing high reps with the 115 pounds in the squat. And the body is not really adapting because there's, you know, it's almost like and there's not running up a flight of stairs is great. It's really a good thing. Running hills is great. But if you really want the adaptions, you gotta have load on there to force the body to adapt. You'll get adaptions from hill sprints. They're not bad. Doing 115 pound back squats, I mean it's better than well, 105, right. but it's still not enough to nudge the body into adaption. So I start coaching, uh, and I got actually hired by Coach Mon to be his uh, strength and conditioning coach, 1979, and I, I might have been the first uh, college strength and conditioning track and field coach. There might have been a few, it, like Nebraska had a strength and conditioning coach, but I, I might be the first. And the reason he hired me, he says he was really getting worried about what he was seeing the guys doing, and it was bodybuilding. Again, 
gentle listener. There's nothing wrong with bodybuilding. And after age 55, you must bodybuild. You have to. But if you want to be the, uh, an elite athlete, you have to train for other qualities. And it's real hard to train for all the qualities all the time. Right. You know, I'm gonna, today I'm going to do every Olympic event, both winter and summer. Well, yeah, call me when you're done with that. You know, <laughs> I'm, I'm, a good, I'm a, just a downhill ski run, you know, and then the triathlon. Yeah, good luck on that. Get back to me. So when I first started coaching coaching, I, I had to teach uh, in just a five or six year period the college athletes were already coming up without any Olympic lifting or powerlifting backgrounds, but they could tell you 300 curl variations and they, but they didn't have the, they didn't have the big engine. So back then is when I first started thinking, okay, so here's what's missing. Okay. Now fast forward again to, uh, the, when the internet kind of started showing up, I started noticing that there was programs with six variations of vertical pressing, 10, horizontal pressing with the flies with the and all of a sudden i realized that if you elite athletes need to they can't do that much and that's when i started to break out i, I got to get people away from horizontal and vertical push and then later obviously pull just it's, it's you don't have to think about it, it just shows up but i also started picking up that if i could get the athlete to do like six weeks of military presses which they'll push back on mm -hmm. But when they get back to the bench press, the ne those next six weeks, it's like, oh, my bench went up because you military. Mm -hmm. Oh, boom, light goes on. And then that's kind of how I started to, to, to rein the push and pull in. I'm hoping you're listening here. So I had to rein back the push and pull. Then what do we supplement it with? Well, squats. So if I'm just working with you one-on-one, -on -one, I can teach you the squat over a couple of weeks. But when I have 65, 14 year old boys, mm -hmm. I needed a different tool set. And so at first I did the potato sack squat and then later I developed the goblet squat, okay? And because they they had no ability to squat, they, they could not do the, mo the motion. And then when they did try to do it, it was just so funky. So, you know, I'm sitting there, okay, I think I've got the push. I, I've dealt with the push and pull by, you know, breaking it in blocks. And now I'm teaching the squat every day because that's just, we're just going to use that as a warm-up until we can go to front squats and back squats and all that squats. And then the hinge family was difficult. And, and, and that's my own mistake because it was so obvious and clear to me because being an Olympic lifter, you know, you, that's just that position. And then I realized I didn't have any tools to regress the hinge. I could teach you the snatch and clean, but what if you had a shoulder injury? I, I didn't have any tools. So then I had to kind of regress. Oh, and then you start coming up with these ideas. And then I, I, I started doing that. It got to the kettlebell certifications. Oh, there's a way to do it. Talking to Brett Contreras about the hip thrust. Oh, there's another way to do it. And okay. So the push, the pull, the hinge, the squat. And then one of the most fortunate disasters in my life, I broke this wrist in eight pieces uh, at an Olympic lifting meet. It's not Olympic, it's, I'm an idiot. I refused to let go of the bar and my elbow hit the ground. That's kind oh, of good. <laughs> yeah, it was bad. Awesome. Elbow hit the, and then the bar re-entered my hand oh. and blew my wrist apart. So my doctor says, you'll never lift weights again. Well, if you know me, that's, that's a non-starter because, uh, uh, Lifting weights keeps me from murdering people. Right. I, I, you know, it's, that's your drug. It's, yeah. What's your drug of choice? <laughs> <laughs> One more step. Yeah. Right. Uh, so Mike Rosenberg uh, came up with this cool little thing for me just to hold like this. And it was this little, it was a series of <clears throat> iron uh, pieces of iron. One real small, one real big, one. And if you lifted it like this and turned it, well, <clears throat> I'd finished the rehab, but I had no strength. Mm. So I noticed that when I just carried it, it felt better. And then from there, I could do farmer walks and suitcase carries. And I started doing sled drags and sled poles. And then a heavy backpack with farmer bars dragging a sled juggernauts. A heavy uh, pushing a sled with a backpack. All these things and all these deadlift walks you need to deadlift a weight and walk with it press a weight and walk with it and then i start going to these uh, track meets and i'm throwing farther than i ever had before remember i'm 43 44 here mm -hmm. i'm not a child right i'm a i'm an accomplished guy age 47 the best throw of my athletic career no way that's impressive and people keep coming up and 
So what are you doing? Steroids. You know, that, <laughs> yeah. that nod yeah. is in the international sign language for what drugs are you doing? Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, so Loaded Carries just became uh, foundational. And then a guy named Steve Ledbetter said, well, what about everything else? And I said, well, that's everything else. And that, that's when we came up with the fancy term, the sixth movement. Yeah. So push, pull, hinge, squat, load to carry. And then, you know, the sixth movement. What's that? Anything else? Anything else you throw out at me? Uh, I personally like like uh, crawling, uh, the Turkish getup. If you look at the Turkish getup, you'll see there's lunges in there. You'll see there's rolling in there. I like rolling. Uh, so I like groundwork, and then I like breaking. Oh, those are my two favorite six movements. Breaking and rope climbing, uh, monkey bars, uh, rings, uh, hanging. Uh, uh, just, go to a, just go to a park and get yourself up and down off of things probably as healthy as anything you do for your shoulders mm -hmm. and then the groundwork and of course i also i tell my athletes and my students this if poopy comes down and there's just like this heavy noxious gas <clears throat> that's uh lighter than air and it's filling us those of us who are good at crawling will survive yeah. next day we get a heavy noxious gas that's really heavy those of us who climb will survive and i say so these exercises are survival exercises and everybody laughs until that one time they need to crawl or right. climb to save somebody or whatever and when you orchestrate those movements together you really start to so i'm looking at a program and i the first thing i look at is i look for the balance of your okay so the, the hypertrophy movements on that list are the pull the push and the squat those are the those are the ones that make you look good the ones that make you a great athlete are the hinge and the load of carries. And the ones that kind of knit things back together would be the six movement. Weirdly, crawls and rolls and all that stuff, tumbling, knits you back into being one piece. Uh, if you can't monkey bar because you weigh 700 pounds, once you, I, if you start to monkey bar two years later, we can assume something good has happened. Right. So... The push, the pull, and the squat, the number one thing I look at is what are your numbers weekly? And I insist that if you do 200 pushes every week, you need to do 200 squats every week. The numbers have to be the exact same reps. Now, load's an issue, and all those other parameters are tough. I get it. But very often, and it, I've, in the book, I actually quote a friend of mine. He uh, played linebacker for the Colts. Uh, he was a, actually captain of the Super Bowl team, too. He would send me a program. Push, 237 reps. Pull, 115. Squats, 25. And I'd say, no, no, they have to be the same. 180 pushes, 180 pulls, 70 squats. No, have to be the same. Very quickly, you realize that if you do a standard, a traditional program, five sets of five, uh, bench press, uh, row, front squat. Five sets of five, three days a week, 75, 75, 75. You line up, your joints feel better. Uh, you're, you're obviously you'll put on some mass because of all those squats and big lifts. And to me, that so that's how I order. The second thing I look at, and then of course I look at the quality. Are those authentic, intelligent squats for what your goals are? Most people now it's goblet squats, and then we do a thing. You goblet squat, and then you pick up a stick, a broomstick, and you do an overhead squat. Squat back down, put the stick back down goblet squat up it's called the goblet squat the overhead squat drill it's just a broomstick mm -hmm. but when people do their first step they stand up and go okay i didn't and then they tell you a story mm. i didn't realize how tight my lower back was i didn't realize how tight my hips were i had no idea how tight my shoulders were. i couldn't believe it and i was so exhausted from doing that stick it's only a broomstick and so they did they gave you this dialogue of their own self-assessment uh, yeah it's assessment yeah right so you stand there and go yeah i and, and you want to almost say, yeah, I told you that, I told you that, I told you that. But they, you can't always hear that. You have to sometimes get pushed. And then we look at your hinge. Now, if you're doing deadlifts, you know, six deadlifts could be the last workout you do for two years because of the amount of emotional and neurological hit, heavy deadlifts. But if I do the 10,000 swing challenge with 500 swings with a 24 versus a 628 deadlift, which 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 is what what's harder 500 swings with 24 or 628 deadlift well you can see the problem so that's yeah, oh yeah so that's hinges and then on loaded carries the, the response is simply this do them 
Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, got that. And then when it comes to the everything else family, then I would. That's when we'd sprinkle in that as warm ups, cool down, uh, maybe maybe even a jungle gym kind of thing. We sometimes at my gym, we, I put a ladder and a rope on a tree, and we just play around on it. Just just play. It's called Jungle Gym Day. And you know, you try to go from this to we got ring, we had rings on it, but the <clears throat> uh, the tree had a little issue with the, in a windstorm, uh, so we lost that massive limb. Uh, but we had rings, we had a rope, and so you you know you're on you do the rope climb, you're at the top, and then you kind of Tarzan yourself over to the dip the, the, to the rings, then you kind of do a weird looking reverse kettlebell swing to pop yourself up onto the ladder, and then you climb, and it's why do we do it? Because it's fun and it's stupid. Different. It's different. Variability. And, you know, you wake up the next day and you feel a little tweaky. Yeah. Whatever those tweakies are, that may be a gap. Is that gap flexibility, mobility, body comp? I don't know. But you know it. You know it. Yeah. I sensed it. But now you're, you're your number one advocate for your gaps and weaknesses. Right. You're telling me what your gaps and weaknesses are. And how often do you do that? workout yeah. is that a oh, once a week uh, thing or? we got to get <clears throat> we got to get that limb back on that tree so so <laughs> yeah that was in all, a perfect world how about that yeah. uh once a week yeah. once a week yeah. i think tumbling is a once a week thing with your collision athlete collision occupation i think playing is a playing like that would be once a week throwing a frisbee back and forth as a warm up i still think it's a, a football base is superior to most of the crap i see mm-hmm. can well, you train every day like, do you believe, like, if yes. you, yeah. Uh, no. Okay. <laughs> Train, workout, move. Can you work out every day, you know, where you're a sweaty mess and you you can up to from age 17 to 34. You can. Right. And then, hi, <laughs> this is the bill. Welcome to middle age. <laughs> <laughs> Here's your bill. You got to pay it now. Uh, so you can you could probably do workouts uh, up until a certain age every day. Training, I think you should do every day. So I'm 67. So what do I want to do in training at my age? Well, I want to. Okay, okay. I can't sell any of this, folks. Every eight nine hours sleep every night. Drink copious amounts of water every day. Eat protein and vegetables at every meal. Walk every day. Floss your teeth. Okay, those to me that's. Okay. To me, that, those, that's training. After that, then then I might do. I probably do some form of mobility every day. I do glute work with uh, glute bands almost every single day. Okay, uh, especially when I travel. When I travel, it's every day. Uh, you know, and it, I told the group. Someone asked, uh, "You get on your back. You do 15 hip thrusts, 15 clamshells, 14 hip thrusts, 14 clamshells, 13, 13, 12, 12, all the way down to one one. It's it's a lot of volume, but it instantly fixes your posture mm. i mean I, I think for my age and the number of surgeries i've had i think my posture is pretty good yeah you know what i mean yeah I mean, yeah i mean and i and i think it's because i have such a good glute and i have a good glute and overhead press focus and i think that so once you hit a certain age uh, 35 your glutes and your overhead work uh keep keep you in the game longer keeping the game okay so that's kind of where this all so i would say i was clear about my matrix there's been changes but it's at least the matrix i use now is 10 years old with two small changes i used to have a lot more uh hip thrust regressions in it now i just have the hip plus uh uh, hip thrust with the glute hold and that that does all the teaching for it mm-hmm. uh it's a glute bridge uh it's it's not the hip it's not the reps it's a hold with with an ab hold at the same time mm-hmm. that that cleaned up the teaching I, i'm constantly look, looking for smarter faster ways to teach the and so and when you look at what how I coach, you might be saying, "Now is that a regression?" No, that's just a some that's a mobility move for him. It's a regression for her. It same exercise, mm-hmm. different nuance. I I think yeah. one of the most underrated books that are out there is your book Easy Strength of Pavel Sotlin. Well, you know, there's two well, new editions. I didn't know it. There's two editions of that. So I wrote the Easy Strength Omni book and then Easy Strength for Fat Loss. Like I told the audience today, I've written about a thousand pages on Easy Strength, and I can't believe I did it because I I figured it out with six sentences. But no matter what I say or do, people always want 
What if you? Uh, it's just, it, but it's the best kept secret. I feel like I know so many people. I'm like, you just need to read this book. It is so amazing. Yeah. So you'd be surprised how many professional athletes do it. Yeah, you'd be surprised how many teams do it. Uh, I, I am, I'm always. Uh, I'll be at these high school baseball programs. I look at their workouts, and it's like, do, why are you doing this? Well, this this works. This this works. This muscle that works, and I'm like, dude, I make a lot of. People pay me money to help their pitchers throw faster. How fast do you throw? 72 miles an hour. And your workout is six hours in the weight room. I know. But the beauty of that book was like the clinical pearls. I'm sure you know, you of course know Mel Siff and super training. That book, I, I mean, it's a tome and it's just like so difficult to get through it all. I felt like that book, Easy Strength kind of summed up all the stuff yeah. from the Eastern world and like made it so digestible. Well, most of the stuff out of the Soviet Union is, is absolute crap. Right. I mean, I mean, I, you know, go to a, go to a meat packing plant, all that smell. That's what most of that is. Um, I mean, I have had, okay, God bless him. He's, he's no longer with us. Yuri Sadiq, the great, uh, the, the, still the world record holder in the hammer. I've had lunch 50 times, I've had dinner with them 50 times, breakfast 50 times. We would sit down and I would ask him these questions and he would just do this. No, no, we no. no. I, 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 I heard, and then he, and then sometimes if I got him in a good mood, he'd go, yeah, I heard that. And that is, that is, and he used a potty word. And he said, he, this person was never at our, they don't know anything. We never did that access, the step up. He, when you mentioned the step up to Yuri, Oh, oh, he would get so pissed <laughs> off. It's like not one time, never, not one time. What about the? And, he, and my other friend Vasily, uh, he's from uh, he's fr he's from the Soviet bloc, but one, I, I don't remember which country it is. I want to be careful in this day and age on making that mistake. But you know, yeah. <laughs> don't cancel yourself. I want, yeah, I don't know. I don't want to get a, a arrested when I <laughs> show up in Moscow. Uh, but. Uh, he leaned in one time, he goes to me, Dan, most of the great weightlifters were uh, illiterate. They couldn't read the programs. I'm like, what? He goes, yes, these are, these are guys who, they, they trained on broken bars in these places, and they would snatch 200 kilos. I'm like, okay, i got to change, change my training. <laughs> uh, and, and, and they were very clear that, and so, so much of the research is either, honestly, like, well, kind of like my research. Basically, I just make up my own research. Hey, hey, hey. Well, yeah, that worked. Yeah, okay. yeah that, uh, let me steal that idea from you. School of hard knocks. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> but a lot of it's just not true. And it's, we, we still push against it. And uh, I don't, another thing that bothers me is that we've lost our own roots here in, if you want to call it the West. Uh, I, I'm writing the forward to a book about Percy Cerruti, the great Australian track and field coach. And I'm looking through this book and it's like, this stuff he's doing in 1950s is so far superior than the crap that I see at the universities I, when I yeah, visit. Yeah, right. Um, you know, everyone says, well, you know, you this sports specialization. Folks, nobody can get a handle on sports specialization. Whether, okay, honestly, I've been around the best discus throwers in world history. None of them do any of those things that I see these college kids do. You know, these guys, you know, like John Powell and, and, and all these other guys, good friends of mine, they all threw 70 meters doing Olympic lifts and power lifts. Now we got a kid at, you know, I don't want to mention university, <coughs> Utah State, and, you know, and they're telling me how to all do this, and they're throwing 40 meters at the same, with the same uniform on, I threw 58 meters. And you can't listen to me? Okay, and uh, I threw 190, and this guy's throwing 140, and he can't listen to me anything? I have no gems. So that's the problem. You can't learn anything from Dan John? Yeah, that's well, you can't, what a riot. You know, I, you know, in that same uniform, with that same discus, it might be the same exact one, because <laughs> you know, they last. I, threw, I, 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 don't, I don't know. So good. I'm, I, I feel like I'm ranting. No, you're Sorry to interrupt this episode, guys. Hope you're enjoying it. Real quick, we have an amazing, amazing opportunity. The DNS World Congress is coming to Chesterfield, Missouri this June 14th through the 16th, 2024. If you guys attended our NDS or our Neurodynamics Congress, you know that we uh, this is uh, something that's very close to Brett and I's heart, something that we are going to keep doing and keep doing and keep doing. 
So this year's Congress is all about DNS, dynamic neuromuscular stabilization. This is literally uh, like looking into the ocean, as Brett says. This is the lens that we look through each and every one of our patients with. And this is going to be an amazing opportunity because Pavel is back in town. So the originator, the creator of DNS, Pavel Kolash, is coming to the stage for the first time in five or six years. I don't even know how long it's been. Uh, he's bringing along with him Elena Kobosova, which is literally the backbone of DNS. Uh, she's one of the most underrated neuro neurologists in the world. Uh, so we're super excited to hear from her. Uh, Marcella Safarova, if you haven't heard her speak, uh, she is literally the queen of pediatrics and musculoskeletal health. Uh, we also are going to have Ever, almost every single U.S. instructor at the uh, at the Congress who's going to be speaking. It's going to include demos, lectures, hands-on. Uh, we're going to have, as always, uh, a get-together afterwards with your chance to talk to these guys face-to-face uh, -face and have a couple drinks with them. This is going to be a great, great opportunity. There's also, it's a great price too, especially for students. It's only $4.99. Uh, so be sure to use the code DNS student uh, to get your discount on that. Uh, for more information or if you have questions, go to gestaltedu.com backslash DNS dash Congress. Thanks for tuning in, guys. Enjoy the rest of the episode. We're good. So what about like, is there any specialization to the training or is it the six fundamental movements for everyone that you're seeing? So if we walked into your gym, mm. is every athlete basically kind of looking the same or are you tweaking and changing depending on your sport? Not on sports so much, but injuries and gaps. So when you're working with uh, elite athletes, there's always tweaks. There's something... You know, you're always you're always dancing. Yeah. You're always dancing on that razor. I love the line razor's edge. You're always dancing yeah. on the razor's edge. So my elite thrower right now, she has a t she has a bad wrist, and she's going to conference tomorrow, and she has a bad wrist. So we've been we've been working around that bad wrist since September, and but here's the funny thing, she's added uh, three feet to her personal best in the shot put this year. Mm. Three feet in the shot put is yeah, monumental. I mean, you know, yeah, three feet to the javelin. It could just be that the wind went, you know, in the discus, it could just be the, the sector was set right in the shot at that. You, 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 it's good. It's like, right. it's like if you're a nine, nine, eight, uh, nine, nine sprinter. And I say, do this and you run a nine, eight, the whole world's going to be talking about whatever I just said. Right. Right. Yeah. So the shot, puts the same. Um, so, so I would say when, when you're coaching lead athletes, a lot of it is just like, you, you know, you kind of lean in a lot and just what can we do? So with her, she's doing lots of high rep, uh, sets of 10 high rep to me, uh, squats with ch chains. Cause we're trying to, we're trying to almost imitate the Olympic lifts without any stress on her, on her, on her joint. Right. She's doing a lot of suitcase carries because this doesn't hurt. This hurts with the, so, so she's doing ab wheel, suitcase carries, uh, hills, you know, anything that we can just do what we can do. Yeah. So that, so that, and I think that's a good example for you because the push family <laughs> can't dorsiflex the wrist. So you got to with the pull flat family, we could probably play around with the suspension trainers and stuff, but, uh, you know, it's like, okay. And, and we do, but it's, let's throw that in the warm up and health. Let's think health with that. With the squat, okay, the squat now beca has become the hinge. The quick, it's it's become the answer to all questions and loaded carries. Right. So you just have to get what you get. And then the other thing you have to do is <laughs> this is a, this is the hardest thing for a coach to figure out. As a male, if you bench four hundred, these numbers are all light; they're not heavy at all. If you bench four hundred, snatch two fifty, clean three hundred, back squat, back squat, real, real back squat. 450s you are strong enough to be an international level thrower those aren't heavy weights now a lot of the listeners back oh my god that I, that's my goal something yeah and, and for the rest of us it's like mm, yeah last time i benched 405 i basically was dressed like this and it was just somebody said hey can you still do this? And it was, his, his name it was, was John. Challenge. Was John Price giving me crap? And so you had I did six it. beers. And no, I didn't. Sadly, I just you would think I was smart enough. <laughs> hold, to, hold my beer. Yeah, yeah, hold my beer. Yeah. So here's why I say those standards. If you're at that level and you're not throwing international numbers, get out of my weight room. The weight room is not your issue. Your issue is your arousal level. Your issue is your tension level. Your, your your heart rate control, right? Your 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 tactics. Uh, you show up to a meet, you don't have a checklist, and you forgot your throwing shoes. You show up to a meet, and uh, you're late because you didn't know where the ring was. You, you you know you you show up to a meet, and well, you didn't take my advice about drinking a lot of orange flavored sugar free Metamucil, and you you have because it's hot and dry, you haven't had a bowel movement in three days. 
that's a biggest fa- that's a bigger factor than getting your back squat from 450 to 465. Right. Right. So your tactics, your strategy, your checklist, uh, your arousal level, your uh, your your heart rate control, your tension control are all far more important than adding a few pounds to your bench. In saying all that, I've been dying to ask you this question. You've obviously been around strength training forever. How much of strength is genetics and how much is trainable? So we're never going to get there because there's a concept in in uh, in uh, DNA, and I'm, I'm not this. I'm out of my range here, but we can nudge by our diet, our exercise. We can nudge certain things to flip on and flip off. Yeah, and I think we're still we're not there yet. Knowing what I'm saying is, I okay. So I do 23 and Me, and one of the things that came back is that. I have a high dominance on my DNA of being fast twitch. Well, everybody who knows me goes, yeah, no shit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Really? You? <laughs> but I also have fast twitch personality. I, I will, you know, if you mess with somebody I like, I will be aggressively interceding for that person before my brain can catch up. <laughs> You're wound tight, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I, I I will be I will be in the fight before I know I'm in the fight. <laughs> it's a good friend. I'm a little bit like a good friend. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, I, 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 so how much of so? There's other factors. That's why I like the book. Uh, uh, not the sport. Is it Epstein's sporting? Oh, gene? the the gene, the sports gene, or the sports gene? Yeah. Yeah. I think, yeah. So Epstein. when you study Usain Bolt, you also discover that couple things he's from a country with a national sport is sprinting Does he that, ate mcdonald's every meal for two straight <laughs> i mean he's also the youngest in his family and the youngest like me are always sprinting to catch up always so i started lifting weights in 1965 because my brothers who i'm the youngest of six were lifting so and then I was the, I'm an August 28th birthday with the September 1st cutoff. So I was a, always the youngest boy in the class. Outliers. So I'm always, so, okay. But think about it this way. In some sports, being the youngest, the oldest is always an advantage. You get those small nudges. But in the sports I'm into, you want the guy who's sprinting to catch up, always trying to find the edge. You know, Yarek, you know, that phrase, rap, you know, uh, uh, you know. Bird, uh, birds of prey. Yep. When you're always behind, you're always looking for the edge. So I lifted weights for anybody else I competed against. Uh, I had throwing shoes before other throwers had throwing shoes. I did the full turn when they were still doing standing throws. When they started doing full turns, I started Olympic lifting. When they started Olympic lifting, I started to do loaded carries. When they started doing loaded carries, I was doing hills. I'm always looking for the edge. Right. So this this is where we're we're not. <clears throat> I'm not sure we'll ever completely get this. You know, there's a lot of twin studies coming out now. Right. Uh, yeah. By the way, some of them are just bogus. You know, the nutritional one. Uh, okay. Uh, it's a... It's, it's, yeah, okay. Uh, but even with twin studies, and Tommy Kono has an interesting one in his book, even with twin studies, uh, one twin could have flipped that switch. You know, I don't know. And maybe there are two different PE classes and, you know, Mr. Roberts in the first PE class emphasized weightlifting and sprinting. Uh, Mr. Jones in third period emphasized dodgeball and basketball. Right. Well, the one that was in that first period class, that might have, the switch might have got flipped. So it is still going to be a little bit, I, 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 I'm not running for your answer. I'm just saying it's still going to be a little bit fuzzy. Well, let me let me change the question. You have a 10-year-old who's just an average athlete. Mm-hmm. He shows up to your gym. What's possible? Can you make him a world-class thrower? No. What we can, we can make him a world-class athlete in the sport that they fit. That's why it's so important that you're, you expose your kids to kayaking, uh, fighting with sabers, boxing, uh, wrestling playing a musical uh, instrument like just you, they need to be exco- and what will happen is very often is the lights will go you'll on. find what yeah. they're the, they'll find because the, you also need so passion comes from the root passios it means suffering it doesn't mean love passion is suffering for what you love so they have to find what their 
willing to suffer for. And I got to tell you, folks, whether it's playing a violin or throwing the discus, you're going to suffer. You're going to give things up. I didn't, right. I mean, I'm, I didn't date for seven years now. This face helped a lot. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> He's back. Yeah. But, uh, you know, I, the, the number of things I gave up for my athletic career is huge because I had such a passion for it. So now I probably should have been a hammer thrower probably, but I had a great career as a discus thrower. I'm very proud of what I did, but I had a passion for it. I loved it. I was willing to go stay out, stay out and throw for hours by myself. And it never bothered me at once. In fact, sometimes I would come home. Uh, we never brought water out when I was young. I would drink water. Uh, mom would say, you're kind of red in the face. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll do it. You know, I drink because I was dehydrated and sunburned. Yeah. And, and then go back out and throw some more. I'd, I'd, re, I'd look at a picture of somebody in Trackfield News and go, I'm going to try that. And, you know, we didn't have any of that YouTube and all this fancy stuff. Is training different for, like, a discus thrower, a hammer thrower, or a javelin thrower? Or is it all the same? So it is you would not see any differences in probably. the gym, yeah. Yeah. But I would I would push certain things. Yeah. So a shot putter would definitely be we would m- want more pressing for a shot putter. We want more uh snatches for the hammer thrower and the discus thrower. It's interesting. I've got a little javelin thrower and she's improving by the week and her program and I I'm not selling uh, selling this to anybody but it's she's doing high rep fast squats and pilates uh you know i got to i I, great praise to joseph pilates he used to smoke and and in one hand and had a and had a and a glass of scotch in his other hand i was coaching i I love anybody anybody who's who who, you know drinks scotch as while coaching they're a friend of mine right yeah yeah Yeah. bring it in um so the thing, but the thing about Pilates is, it, especially the way she does it, being a collegiate <laughs> athlete, she takes it a little more seriously. And she goes, Coach, it's all about this tension, and that's what I feel when I throw. So you might see my javelin throwers, my shot putter, and my discus thrower. They're all squatting. Okay. And then they're all doing suitcase carries. Okay. And then Sophia leaves because she's going to do, go do Pilates or she's, she's over there between sets doing this, you know, variation of a bird dog. She's over there doing, you know, so it, it, it all looks the same. Yeah. You know, I mean, let's be honest. I mean, I love that. I, I always go back to Jim Gaffigan's great line in the, he, when he talks about when he worked uh, at a Mexican food place in Indiana <laughs> and he says uh, the people say, what's it? I can't do the whole riff, but so what's a tostada? Okay, it's beans, you know, it's it's beans, cheese, veggies on a, a tortilla. Oh, what's a taco? It's beans, cheese. <laughs> Just say a word oh, yeah. and I'll bring it back to you. Right. So most of my coaching is beans, cheese, veggies on a tortilla. It all looks the same. It's just we just put a different word on the finished product. Uh, one of the themes in Easy Strength was uh, super stiffness. So how do you reconcile the concept of being able to relax your body versus super stiffness? Oh, 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 oh no, no, no. Don't forget, what's the easiest way to, to get your body to relax? Get as much tension as you possibly can. Yeah. Now, as males, there's a certain act we do where afterwards we always want to take a nap. I can think of, I can think of one thing. <laughs> and because after a certain level of tension and arousal, which are two phrases I use as in coaching. When you go to here and go, oh, my daughter Kelly, I told this story in the workshop just a few minutes ago. First time she ever deadlifted 275, which I consider the standard for female high school athletes. De- a female should deadlift 275. Um, what should a male? Uh, probably double body weight, but it's, I have a whole list of yeah. those, but yeah, this yeah. is just that yeah. line. Um, like I, I was at a workshop, uh, I was at a, uh, a group one time, this guy was telling me about his 350 deadlift and I, I just, enjoy, it was so, I enjoyed this so much. He goes, oh yeah, my daughter, uh, Lindsay was a homecoming queen. She deadlifted 350 in high school too. <laughs> so you're as strong as a homecoming queen. Right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but she, so Kelly deadlifts 275 and instead of putting it back around, she just free releases it, drops it. And she starts to sob afterwards, and it completely changed my uh, coaching career. Her crying. There's no crying in the weight room. 
And I said, what's wrong? And she goes, just leave me alone. I'm just crying. And then I realized that this is why I think it's so good for high school girls to lift weights. All that tension, all gone. Emotional response. So to really learn to relax, I think you go the opposite way. I think you make yourself as tense as possible and then bleed it off. So I can go from 10 to relax very quickly. It's an older method of uh, meditation also, and I think there's real value in it. So if you have an ass choking a lot in meats, just letting the emotions take over, if you can get them to deadlift, even a training session, so deadlift, drop it off. Okay, now let's do a throw into a wall or a net, just I mean, right there in the gym if you can. How'd that feel? Ah, oh, it feels my technique is right on. Because what you, t and then what you do is try to get that tension dump out of me. <clears throat> uh, I always smile in the discus when I throw because I need to be at a, a tension level that allows me to smile. If I can smile, I've dialed in the appropriate tension level for me. Love that, yeah. <clears throat> I always joke too, I'm also smiling because I know I'm about to win. <laughs> People say, how do you know you're about to win? Because I'm throwing the discus. <laughs> so that's, that's, so you, you play around with these other tools. <laughs> right. So the arousal, tension, and heart rate, uh, I want you to figure that out and train where you need to be in competition. Now, there are some sports like American football. If you're on the kickoff team and you're, you know, you're, you're, you know, you're, you're, you're R1, R2, R, the L1, L2, the guys next to the kicker, you're the bombers, your tension levels will be radically different than when you're playing defensive back two plays later, one play later. And you have to be able to, so in football, you've got to be able to maintain various levels of tension and arousal. That's why I hate that BS they do on that, where they all get around before the game, they yell at the camera. That, all it does is raise your tension. In fact, it's a good study. In fact, I'd like our listeners to start watching the Super Bowl through, the, through my lens. Say, normal football game. I love, I love sophomore and junior from varsity football games in America. You know, the kids are showing up. You know, the, the, the home team, they just got out of class. Six period just finished. You know, half an hour ago, the kids are running down to the locker room, throwing on their uniform. They come out. They're still trying to remember whether it was Shakespeare or Cervantes who said, you know, whatever. <laughs> they get on the field. Okay, you ready to go? Get your helmet. Okay, coach. Lock and load. You know, you send the captains out. There's, there's nothing. There's no pomp. You start playing football, and everyone's ready to go. Super Bowl. Okay, so that's the game. Three o'clock, you're in the classroom. Three thirty, you're knocking someone's head around. No, nothing. You you go from uniform zero to, to one hundred. Yeah. Zero to one hundred. Super Bowl. And now Dan John will sing uh, a song that's patriotic in some oblique way. I love our fifty states, including California and Australia, and and they just seem to oh good, and, that, and then the confetti hits, and then three thousand little girls come out and they do a dance, and then they put out the stage so some country and western song guy can can sing a different rendition of America the Beautiful, and then these planes yeah. go over, and then they they still haven't gotten to the Star Spangled Banner yet, and then there's five, and then it's commercials, we have to stop for the commercials. Bow down to our corporate gods. That's right. And then we get the Star Spangled Banner, and it becomes a bestseller, and she becomes very famous for singing this song. And then we have to clean up that whole facility. And then we go out, and, and our honorary captain today from the 1961 Green Bay Packers. And then, and then four more commercials, the really expensive ones. And then they line up for the kickoff. And let me show you what the players look like. Yeah. yeah. Dead. <laughs> Why is the first quarter in the Super Bowl always so horrific? It's terrible football. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because they've been out there for 45 minutes. Standing not, there. Yeah. Not. So their arousal level was here, and then it went. Mm -hmm. And they probably didn't sleep the night before. You know, it, 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 like, remember yeah. Zelda? Remember Zelda? Oh, God, yeah. <laughs> yeah. By the time the game starts, you have a team of Zeldas out there going, Links, I guess. Links. Sorry. Links. Sorry. Yep. I apologize. We're going to get 10,000 comments. <laughs> yeah. It's Link. Yeah, right. I mean, come on. <laughs> get a clue, man. Uh, and, and so that's that. So 
You don't train relaxation, you just train super stiffness, therefore you get relaxation. I train appropriate arousal, tension, and heart rate. And I want you to be able to know how to control it. Now, there are times where maybe I got to, you know, maybe I got to throw more clothes on you because maybe you're, uh, if, you, if, if you got too much physical tension, I would put more clothes on you, make it warm, and I'd have you warm up more because that's just going to make you warmer or relax you. Now, if you don't, if you show up, hey, coach, man, it's the Nationals. I'm so like, ah, oh, I had such a good night's sleep, man. Things are, I need to up. Yeah, you need to. So I'll throw a bucket of water on you or maybe do some planks. Planks? Yeah. Artificially raise it up. Maybe do a drill that's part of your technique. Like, you know, pretend you got a javelin and you, against a fence and pull it to up your tension, to up your tension level. Mm-hmm. So it becomes a so tension arousal and heart rate is my is to me I'd rather spend more time on that than whether or not you do pec decks or you do you're not gonna throw the if anybody thinks the pec throws the discus isn't a very good discus throw right so <clears throat> I'd rather focus on that bring that toolkit up get people the Olympic lifts the power lifts the the the, the farmer walk the hill sprints good that's a perfect program for every athlete in the world. Perfect, hundred thousand percent. Nothing wrong with it. Uh, and then work on the appropriate levels for competition. Right. Because yep. nothing in the gym is going to duplicate what is happening when you're throwing a javelin or yeah. whatever. Yeah. Now in the gym, I can teach you tension. Right. I can teach you mm-hmm. arousal, and I can teach you how to control your heart rate. Right. <laughs> and then our job is to walk you out and go, okay, now let's apply these lessons to what we just did yeah right yeah because i think in sports specific training i mean people have been on a crusade to try to find something in the gym that's going to duplicate what's happening when you're around people who are great at throwing implements we all know like it is so different than what you're seeing in the gym how do you reconcile that thought so the time in the gym is not about trying to reproduce what you're doing out there so what is the time in the gym designed for Lynn Davies was a 64 uh, British uh, long jump Olympic gold medals. And the fact that, that I said he's British in the gold medals. We, in we the long will try to get yeah. No, no. My point being, it's like, okay. Random. Yeah. A little di- well, you know, and, uh, you know, he did singles in the clean and jerk. And he did do some, he did lunges and those leaping lunges or split, you know, split leaping lunges. Yep. And he did a lot of stuff like that. So when you would look at his program, you say, oh, it's really sport specific. But I would look at it and say, no, he is doing some lifts that, you know, it, it, so yes, yes, you can do some sport specificity. Yes. <laughs> yes, you can. But you also have to be, able, he also did clean and jerks, back squat. He all did all the other stuff and then sprinkled the, the other stuff on top. Right. It wasn't, it wasn't. You know, having a discus thrower. Okay, so you finish in this position, so we're going to do lunges in that position, <laughs> right? Because it's not going to matter. Yeah, and, yeah I mean, fun. yeah, it's, bum, bum. So there is there is a place for sports specificity, no question. But to make it work, we're talking about the '64 Olympic long jump champion. Mm-hmm. It's 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 very nuanced. nuanced yeah. And and how much it actually helped, I don't know. Right. No. Yeah. Well, Dan, you got a, you're obviously a very accomplished author, but you got a new book coming out, right? Yeah. Yeah. So tell and us about obviously, that. Obviously, no one's going to buy it because, you know, some people are still talking about books I wrote 13 years ago. <laughs> oh, that's a good hey, thing. The Principles Remain. Get that's easy a good strength thing. right yeah, now. The, the Principles Remain. Easy Strength Omni Book. Yeah. 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 Okay. So, well, tell us, tell us about the new book well, or your next venture. Well, I did this, I put together this thing for uh, the finishers at Kettlebell Certs and all the Kettlebell organizations do it. It's called the Armor Building Complex. Uh, it's two double kettlebell cleans, one double kettlebell press, and three double kettlebell front squats, and then it's I go, you go. Well, like the 10,000 swing challenge, it just got a life of itself. I mean, this thing just, and so people wanted an entire program based on it. I'm like, well, okay, I'll give you the whole, I'll give you the whole book. So do it two times this week, second week, do it once, third week, do it twice. Fourth week, do it once and just do that for a long time. So, Dan, uh, when you say do it, what do you mean? Well, you know, okay. So, how many rounds? Okay. Uh, and then, what should I do in the other days? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, what should I 
which ends up being like a 400 page book when I just answer all the, I mean, that's the problem. Yeah, I have, right. It's like, for me, it's like long winded. That's a good thing. Yeah. Well, it's just like, just do this, you know? And honestly, for me, most of my program is, yeah. I want, when I talk to my throw around, like, so what should I do in the weight room? Uh, fast squats, suitcase carries, do some ab wheel. Okay. Everybody online would be like, so when you say ab wheel, I have the one from Walmart. <laughs> and I've known, uh, I use the steel one yeah. I got from. Uh, no, I, just go in there and do it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, I, and I'll be like. Oh, that's I, so I, didn't humans. I, didn't I tell you everything? I, yeah. Oh, yeah. So I, I'm very proud of the book. I think it's, I think it's good. Yeah. And I'm really glad because I was asked to write a book on hypertrophy for people who didn't want to do mass made simple with all those damn squats. So I think I came up with a good answer. Uh, my guinea pigs, uh, including me, all like it a lot. Uh, weirdly, uh, when I started doing it, I lost weight, uh, but my shoulders got broader and my butt got a little bit, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> Let's just say. Nice teaching. Subtle brag. Hello. Yeah, nice <laughs> flex. I'm just saying, you know, <laughs> got it going on, you know, and, uh, it, I was I was I was shocked to feel to to see it work. Now, obviously, I knew it worked because you know the numbers line up, and you know I don't know if, eh, when you finish when you do a program if you actually do it, things work. <laughs> it's like a diet. I, I I tell this people all the time. Did you follow the diet? Well, mostly. So yeah, because you're that on means a, no. <laughs> so you're on uh, Atkins and you're eating bagels in the first two weeks. Well, they they were at. And then cake, because, you know, we had a birthday party yeah, at the office. Right, yeah, Gotta get yeah, that cake. Yeah. You know, it's like, I love the show The Office, how many times they have birthday parties. And it's like, so you're on a low-carb diet, but you eat cake every day. Yeah, yeah. But do you see the... Yeah. Humans can't make that connection. No, no, no. <laughs> if, yeah. you, if, you, if you follow a diet, if you do a training program, good things happen. Uh, we also know uh, Bill Bryson's great book, The Body, talks about yeah, how, yeah. how people... It, people so if if you tell the doctor i eat about 3000 calories a day the research tells us you eat six <laughs> and then the other thing is if you do a workout most people do the caloric burn times 4 mm. so you know a typical workout might burn i mean not very much at all folks exercise the value exercise is great but follow up on the research. There's a book called Easy Strength for Fat Loss where he takes care of it for you. Uh, but uh, so so with this mobility book, I mean, a problem, uh, hypertrophy book, I, I, I came up with ways, if you follow the program, uh, some of the workouts are tough. The, the week eight on the hypertrophy program, I expect to do 30 rounds of the ABC, which is 90 squats. In 30 minutes and i don't care how much i mean if you just did 90 squats body weight yeah yeah i mean that's you know that's gonna wake up the oh, butt yeah. the butt talks you that. know love it speaking of there's a million dollar idea i had a couple of weeks ago i'm gonna come up with shorts that have an uh argyle ox on them and my clothing line has been called butt ox you heard it here. I mean, right. yeah. Well, we're going to yeah. steal that now. So, yeah. <laughs> money. Don't love get it. me started. I, mean, I love it. Cash cow, so to Angel speak. Angel investor. Oh, Angel. Yeah. Yeah. Cash cow. Yeah. yeah. There you go. Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. But ox, cash but ox, cow. cow. Uh -huh. I see what you did there. I, I see what you did there. I know you're just, yeah, you just kind of roll through it. I get it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, Dan, you're uh, you're an entertainer and a, you're a legend. So we super appreciate you. Uh, yeah, where where can people get your books and, and things like that? If, if you act now, <laughs> yeah. three In easy, the next five minutes, yeah, three easy installments <laughs> of 1944. It's, it, it, there's, we have a bookstore at danjohnuniversity.com, danjohnuniversity.com slash bookstore. Beautiful. Uh, it's also uh, easystrengthomnibook.com, but the new one will be for sure in the bookstore. Got it. So, Got it. And I'm to the point, as we discussed off camera, that I'm struggling shipping and printing fees, folks. I'm sorry. We're at a weird time. It books cost, my books are so big that shipping and printing costs are so subtle flex there big books yeah you know, big come bugs. on oh no well, you know, <laughs> yeah. easy strength i think is full well, it's like eight. it's like your caloric yeah bugs, you're, you're, right, you're yeah. over exactly yeah, 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 it's like your weight it's your bench press uh, yeah, uh, yeah, okay yeah. four page pamphlet <laughs> but it feels like 400 pages. <laughs> yeah that's right uh, so it just it's just and i tell people if you want to print a copy just 
get it printed. Uh, that's what I do. Just, yeah. Because I can't with the the way shipping has changed. I, I, I it's weird because I'll talk to other people and they'll be like, "Yeah, I thought this book would cost blah blah blah." The big printing houses can still. So if you're a big name, yeah, you can still print a book. But, For sure. Well, I think one of one of Dan's gold medals is he takes difficult concepts and training and you make it simple. Like, and I think that's all your books are very good at doing that. And I think that uh, all your books are great. So yeah. yep. I would highly recommend them. Honestly, they're they're very readable. They're just yeah. Yeah, yeah. Thank uh, really, and thanks for doing this, uh, uh, Gestalt. Huh? Yeah, yeah, Gestalt. You now, gotta... what do you guys mean by that? Just for clarity. Uh, so Gestalt, the sum is greater than the parts. So and uh, synergy. Yep. Yeah. So we we're big on uh, you know manual therapy and things like that. So yeah. our kind of big ploy is uh, you know you you can be a great adjuster, great at manual therapy, great at programming, whatever that looks like. But you're even better if you're great at all of those things when you so combine them all together. I, one, and that's what I try. So we're on the same page. Yeah. If you're not getting your nine hours, eight nine hours of sleep, you're not eating your veggies and protein, you're not drinking water, uh, you're not walking. How is my program going to give you your, but if you get those nine hours, <laughs> if you eat the, you know, uh, my nutritionist asked me to eat a lot of protein. I got to tell you, it is a game changer, oh, yeah. <laughs> game changer. Uh, and I'm 67. So God only knows what you children would get out of that. But, uh, you're right. It's, I, we call it one plus one equals three in my books. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, and exactly. it's the same. That's, same. that's Gestalt. Yeah, it is Gestalt. Yeah, 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 well, yeah, exactly. syn- the word, I like synergy, mm-hmm. but it's the same. I want yep, to make sure we're it yeah. the same oh, thing. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. So we're both, you know, we're synergists. <clears throat> and it's, uh, and if I know we're running long, but no, no. if you have an athlete and you can get them into that concept, that, and this is my great thrower, Emily, my, I've doubled her distance in four years because she's figured out that it's, it's not magically the weight room. It's not. It's not just the weight room. It's not just the throwing. It's the sleeping. It's the arousal and the control. It's the, it's the hydration having, and all the. It's yeah, all yeah, the other yeah. stuff, and then you add all that together. All of a sudden, it's got what's what's her secret? It's buy low, sell high. Yeah, yeah, no yeah, secret. yeah. Love it. You know, no secret. Well guys, said. I really appreciate this. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Man. What a Superstar. pleasure. Uh, yeah, thank you for your time. And uh, guys, uh, I'll, I'll link all the, the uh, things in the show notes for where you can find the books and things like that. So, yeah, I really uh, appreciate it. Yeah, that. we yeah. appreciate you, John. And uh, I, if we can ever do this again, I would love it. I, I, I well, know, we got to come to your facility and do it. That's what we'll do next. Yeah, I know. I re- uh, you're always welcome. Yeah. Half the world's been in my house, I swear. I love it. I love it. <laughs> Let's do it. That's beautiful. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Dan. Yeah, appreciate, appreciate you, brother. Yeah. yeah. All right, guys. Good luck with patience, and we'll see you next time, all right? I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Gestalt Education Show. Uh, If you liked it, share it, subscribe to it, uh, send it to your friends, send it to someone that needs to hear this message. Uh, We really want everyone to be able to to tune in and and get the the best clinical advice that they can, which uh, we're hoping that we're giving to you with these special guests. So um, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to us. Or if you have any suggestions on upcoming uh, conversations, let us know. Uh, For a list of our upcoming courses, we're adding them all the dang time. So go to gestaltedu.com, click on courses, and they'll all be right there for you. All right, have a good day.